He recently wrapped up an impressive Navy career and was looking forward to some well-deserved family time. He shared a strong bond with his beautiful 14-year-old daughter and felt grateful for the unwavering support from his devoted wife of many years. His successful career owed much to her because he depended on her to manage things at home during his numerous deployments at sea. But their world came crashing down when a brutal act shattered everything they cherished most. The walls were smeared with blood. Uneaten food lay at their feet. A gun, suspected to be the murder weapon, was discovered beside his body, and an ominous message scrawled in lipstick was on the bathroom mirror. The lifeless bodies had been there for several days. It was a mystery. Everyone left with the memory of this horrific scene wrestled with painful questions. Had something gone awry with their daughter's boyfriend? Could her young romance have taken a deadly turn? Or was there a more sinister truth that no one was willing to accept? The anguish ran so deep that they struggled to fathom the possibility that this could turn out to be what so many of these cases are, an inside job. This is the story of Aaliyah Johnson. We're going to get into it, but first be sure to click the like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on updates to this story, trending true crime topics, and so much more. Now let's get into it. June 1st was a typical, beautiful, warm summer Friday in the sun-drenched city of San Diego, California. The weekend was beginning in its usual radiant glory. However, as the sun dipped below the horizon that Friday night, an unsettling darkness draped the home of Regina Johnson and her husband, Reuben. Provoked by a growing worry, the police received a phone call to conduct a wellness check from Regina's sister. Traditionally, Regina and her sister shared a daily routine. It was their thing to talk on the phone all the time. Yet as days passed without hearing from Regina, her sister's concern increased. After a few days, Regina would finally reach out to her sister-in-law, who resided in Washington State. What Regina would tell her in that call immediately prompted her to call the San Diego Police Department to request a wellness check. Officers were sent to the residence about 1.30 a.m. on June 2nd. When the patrol officers arrived at the Johnson's San Carlos condo, they encountered silence behind the door with no immediate response. Despite the absence of an answer, everything seemed normal at first glance. The officers thought that it might simply be taking a bit longer for someone to come to the door, so they continued knocking. After numerous attempts, the door would slowly creak open to reveal Regina Johnson standing there. But she remained silent, offering no words in response to the knock. Concerned, one of the officers asked, You okay? Again, Regina remained unresponsive, her blank stare adding to the unsettling encounter. Then without uttering a word, Regina retreated into the apartment, leaving the door slightly opened. The officers followed her in, but were puzzled as Regina appeared disoriented, dazed as if she was unsure of where she was. While Regina made her way to the couch, sitting there in silence, the officers conducted a preliminary sweep of the apartment. It was down the hall that they made a gruesome discovery. Just outside one of the bedrooms, officers found Reuben Johnson lying face up in a pool of blood. The immediate realization hit them. He was dead. Continuing their look around the apartment, the officers directed their attention to the open bedroom doorway where Reuben's body was discovered. Inside the room, a horrifying scene awaited them. Lying face down on the floor of her bedroom was Regina and Reuben's 14-year-old daughter, Aaliyah. Hailing from Lynchburg, Virginia, 56-year-old Reuben Johnson was a man who always prioritized family. He was described as a jokester and having a perpetual smile that could light up any room. Graduating high school in the mid-70s, Reuben dedicated two decades of his life building a career in the U.S. Navy. Reuben was known for being an upstanding man with a strong sense of discipline that resonated throughout his life and career. This commitment resulted in an impressive 20-year tenure in the Navy, where he achieved the rank of Chief Petty Officer by the time of his retirement. While in the military, Reuben's wife, Regina, was his biggest supporter. 
When the couple first met the Reuben's best friend, the connection between Reuben and Regina ignited sparks, leading to a swift and deep love that led to marriage. Then around the Thanksgiving holiday, the couple would surprise their family back in Washington with the announcement that they were expecting. Knowing how desperately Regina desired to be a mother, the family was elated to hear the news. And Regina's sister Katrina was bestowed the honor of becoming their baby's godmother. Katrina's first official act as godmother would be to help Regina choose the perfect name for their soon-to-arrive little girl. And as soon as Aaliyah arrived, she swiftly became the center of Regina and Reuben's world, capturing their hearts as the true love of their lives. Being the wife of a military man often comes with unique responsibilities and challenges. Reuben's frequent deployments at sea meant that Regina had to shoulder the day-to-day -day responsibilities of managing their household, making her the primary caregiver for Aaliyah. Despite the challenges of not having Reuben around for extended periods of time, Regina and Aaliyah developed a close and strong bond over the years. They invested a significant amount of time engaging in various mother and daughter activities, such as shopping and pampering sessions with manicures and pedicures. Regina took pride in being able to provide these experiences for her daughter, although she sometimes found herself overspending in the process. And although Reuben spent a great deal of time away, upon his return home, he seamlessly slipped back into his fatherly role. He took a proactive interest in Aaliyah's academic progress, ensuring she was on track for college. Aaliyah, who was also a freshman at West Hills High School in Santee, California, not only excelled academically, but also participated in cheering during her freshman year. Described by her friends and family as a beautiful, vivacious, and intelligent young lady, Aaliyah embodied humility and sweetness. She was recognized for her tremendous potential, with loved ones acknowledging her ability to pursue any dream she set for her life. During her freshman year, Aaliyah embraced a teenage milestone by entering her first romantic relationship with a young man named Xavier Marshall. By all indications, Aaliyah appeared to be flourishing as a young lady. But on June 1st, the family's home, intended as a sanctuary, transformed into the setting of a brutal crime. According to Regina's sister, she had gone silent for three days. And when she finally made contact, Regina didn't sound like herself. This worried her sister-in-law, so she called police requesting they conduct a welfare check at her residence. And when police arrived, they found Regina in a disoriented, non-verbal state. They also found Reuben lying face up in a pool of blood and Aaliyah face down in her bedroom. Both had sustained gunshot wounds. The bodies were in a state of decomposition, having been there for several days. This prompted investigators to consider the possibility of an intruder. Was there someone within the family who witnessed the crime? Or worse, has someone in the family committed this horrific act? But Regina, the sole survivor in the apartment, remained silent. She appeared confused and dazed. With her husband and her daughter now deceased, could she be in a state of shock or could she be connected to this heinous crime? At this stage in the investigation, police were uncertain whether Regina was involved in the murders or if she was merely a witness to the crime. Regina was transported to the hospital for a psychiatric evaluation. While detectives processed the crime scene, they found Reuben's lifeless body outside his daughter's bedroom door. He had two gunshot wounds, one in the torso and one in the head. Adjacent to Reuben's body, detectives found a blood-splattered cell phone and his earpiece still in his ear. There also was a handgun on the floor beside him. On the floor just outside Aaliyah's bedroom was a plate, fork, a salad, and a partially eaten piece of pizza. Aaliyah's lifeless body lay face down a few feet from her bedroom door, covered with a blanket. She had been shot at close range at the back of her head. Next to Aaliyah, investigators found a jar of petroleum jelly, also stained with blood, indicating she might have been holding it when she was shot. Among many items, detectives took from the apartment a pink blanket, a Bible, prescription medications, and a handgun. They surmised that Aaliyah likely had no inkling of the danger awaiting her as she was gunned down with her back turned. It was an execution-style shooting. Relying on the available evidence, detectives pieced together a possible sequence of events. 
Their theory suggested that Aaliyah was the first target, then Reuben followed. It was speculated that Reuben, upon hearing the first gunshot, rushed to his daughter's room and surprised Aaliyah's killer. Then Reuben was shot in the torso, and as he collapsed, he was dealt a fatal shot to the head. This theory, however, raises lingering questions. The firearm recovered at the scene was swiftly identified as belonging to Reuben Johnson, and through ballistic analysis, they also determined that it was indeed the murder weapon used to kill both Aaliyah and Reuben. This information caused detectives to wrestle with the mystery of how the assailant obtained the gun. Given the absence of signs of forced entry and the lack of stolen items, investigators were led to one theory, that the killer must have been someone known to both Aaliyah and her father. Could Regina be the killer? In a shocking turn of events, detectives couldn't dismiss the possibility that Regina might have been the one that took the lives of her daughter and husband, so detectives would soon turn to neighbors for leads. But unfortunately, their questioning of the neighbors about any sounds or disturbances on the night of the incident yielded no leads. Most neighbors denied hearing anything and instead painted the Johnsons as a harmonious family. They talked about how close-knit they were. But one neighbor would give detectives a tip revealing that they overheard Aaliyah and her father arguing on multiple occasions. The neighbor said that the crux of the contention stemmed from Reuben's disapproval of Aaliyah's boyfriend, Xavier. Described by friends and family as a highly protective father, Reuben expressed concern that Aaliyah was becoming less focused on her studies because of her involvement with Xavier. According to the neighbor, Reuben was heard insisting that Aaliyah break it off with Xavier. It seems that Aaliyah indeed followed her father's wishes and severed ties with Xavier. However, this decision seemed to contribute to a growing distance between Aaliyah and her parents. She wanted more independence. Armed with the knowledge that Aaliyah's military father, who was known for enforcing strict rules, had demanded her to end the relationship, investigators couldn't help but entertain the possibility that Xavier, feeling angry after the breakup, might have sought revenge against Aaliyah and her father. With this lead in mind, investigators promptly pursued Xavier for questioning. The next morning, Xavier's parents took him to the police station for questioning. In the early stages of the discussion, investigators inquired, When was the last time you spoke with Aaliyah? Xavier promptly responded, About two weeks ago, confirming the neighbor's account of Aaliyah breaking up with him. Detectives pressed further, asking, Did this make you mad? Xavier admitted that it did, but vehemently asserted that he would never harm Aaliyah. He explained that he didn't want to end the relationship, but Aaliyah's father was concerned about the attention she was devoting to him. But Xavier wasn't finished there. He would go on to disclose that Aaliyah had confided in him about troubling details at home. According to Xavier, Aaliyah expressed concerns about Regina's behavior, describing her mother as acting strangely, appearing depressed, staying in bed frequently, and not being her usual active self. Aaliyah mentioned that her mother cried frequently, and Aaliyah expressed a fear that Regina might engage in self-harm. But Xavier's next confession would alter the course of the investigation. Xavier then warned detectives, You should know that I don't think her mom was just a danger to herself. Intrigued, detectives leaned in and asked, What do you mean? Xavier then dropped a bombshell, revealing that he overheard Regina say she was going to kill Reuben. When pressed on the reasons why she would do this, Xavier claimed not to know. Detectives were at a loss. They didn't know what to believe post their meeting with Xavier. If anything, his comments raised more questions. If Regina indeed did this, what was the motive? Could Xavier be attempting to misdirect the investigation, trying to take the pressure off of himself? So detectives decided to turn up the heat. When was the last time you saw Aaliyah? They questioned. Xavier responded, Tuesday at school. To delve deeper, they asked, Have you been to her house in the last few days? Xavier asserted that he hadn't. With suspicions lingering, detectives aimed to substantiate Xavier's alibi by speaking with his parents. Seeking clarity on his whereabouts over the past few days, they questioned his parents. And his parents vehemently affirmed Xavier's statements, emphasizing that he was at soccer practice during the specified time frame. They adamantly asserted that their son could not have been involved in such a crime, emphasizing Xavier's lack of knowledge about handling firearms, let alone committing a double homicide. 
Observing his demeanor throughout the interview, investigators were left with the impression that Xavier couldn't be responsible for the heinous crime. He seemed openly distraught about the events, and following discussions with his parents, detectives decided to exclude him from their list of suspects, redirecting their focus squarely onto Regina. And they soon after received good news that Regina's condition had improved, so they headed over to the hospital to get her statement. When they arrived, it was evident that she had shown improvement, though not fully recovered. She appeared somewhat dazed still. As the sole individual with direct knowledge of the events at her apartment, detectives were eager to document Regina's official statement. When Regina began recounting the events to detectives, her emotions were palpable, particularly when discussing Aaliyah. However, her tone shifted when Reuben became the topic. She expressed anger, describing him as controlling, a tyrant, and harsh toward Aaliyah, especially regarding her boyfriend. Regina conveyed that Reuben was intensely opposed to Xavier visiting and going up to Aaliyah's bedroom, emphasizing that it was not appropriate because they were no longer children. The disparity in parenting styles between Regina and Reuben became evident. She was much more relaxed and trusting. Regina asserted that on the morning of the murder, Reuben left for a doctor's appointment around 8 a.m. It was picture day at Aaliyah's school. Aaliyah had chosen to wear a blue dress from her mother's closet. Regina said that she intended to get Aaliyah to school by 10 a.m., ensuring she arrived on time for the pictures, so she opted to let her daughter sleep in a bit. Regina recounted that Aaliyah was still in the process of getting ready when Reuben unexpectedly returned home. He was not supposed to be back until 11 a.m., but arrived before 10 a.m. Upon finding Aaliyah still at home, Reuben became upset, questioning why she hadn't left for school. What are you doing here? Why are you not at school? Reuben questioned. His dismay escalated into a heated exchange, a yelling match where he emphasized to Aaliyah, school is your priority. Hearing the escalating argument, Regina says she rushed into the hallway to intervene and calm the situation. However, according to Regina, Reuben redirected his anger toward her, leading to a heated argument between them. Regina said that she confronted Reuben directly, expressing her disapproval of how he was speaking to their daughter. She said she tried to intervene and put a stop to the escalating tension. Regina detailed that during the argument, Aaliyah fled from the room but returned moments later with Reuben's gun. Fed up with his rules and strictness, Aaliyah seemed to have reached a breaking point. However, the retired military man responded instinctively to the sudden presence of the weapon in the room. Then what happened? Detectives questioned. I still can't believe he did it, Regina exclaimed. She said Reuben knocked the gun from Aaliyah's hands. Then a shot rang out, killing their daughter on the spot. Regina said it was Reuben who pulled the trigger. According to Regina, her daughter had stepped in between them during the fight to shield her when Reuben shot Aaliyah in the back of the head. Aaliyah dropped to the floor and Regina screamed, What have you done? Reuben then dropped the gun to the floor and in the chaos of the moment, she grabbed it. It all happened so fast, Regina said. She said she picked up the gun and yelled at her husband, What did you do? You shot my baby girl. Then Regina said that she pulled the trigger, firing two shots, killing her husband. In a shocking declaration, Regina just admitted to detectives that she killed Reuben after he killed Aaliyah. Regina claimed that while she was overwhelmed by anger, she grabbed the gun and shot Reuben. Considering statements from the neighbor and Xavier, who highlighted Reuben's strict parenting and tension within the home, Regina's narrative seemed plausible to investigators. If her narrative proves accurate, it might explain her conduct and shed light on the reasons why she spent days inside the condo with the bodies. Regina told the officers that she found it difficult to say goodbye. She shared that she covered her daughter's body with a blanket and she laid next to Aaliyah's body for nights. I just couldn't leave my baby, she tearfully told the officers. However, certain aspects of Regina's story raised doubts among detectives. Reuben had been shot twice and although Regina claimed self-defense, suggesting she feared Reuben would come after her, inconsistencies emerged at the crime scene. Notably, there were no shell casings on the floor, indicating Regina's efforts to clean up. 
Another perplexing element was the blood-spattered jar of petroleum jelly discovered next to Aaliyah's lifeless body. The pattern of blood on the Vaseline jar suggests it was in her hand when she was shot, a detail that was inconsistent with Regina's narrative about Aaliyah obtaining Ruben's gun. Regina provided no explanation for this, stating, I don't know what that's about. It was on the counter. I don't know why it was next to her. I don't know why there's blood on it. Detectives were also wrestling with the presence of the partially eaten pizza and salad strewn on the floor near Reuben. Regina claimed she had gotten it for Aaliyah, but during the altercation with Reuben, it ended up on the floor. Following their conversation with Regina, detectives reached out to Reuben's sisters, who were still struggling with their heartbreak from the shocking news of their brother and niece's deaths. Reuben's sisters adamantly rejected Regina's account of the tragic events. They were firm, insisting there was no way Reuben would harm his daughter, let alone shoot her. The idea that Regina claimed to have killed Reuben in self-defense after he allegedly killed Aaliyah seemed illogical to them. Detectives probed further, seeking insight into Reuben's relationship with Aaliyah from his sisters. The perspective from Reuben's family painted a distinctly different picture than Regina's portrayal. While acknowledging Reuben's strictness, they refuted the image of him as the tyrant Regina described. According to Reuben's sisters, he was concerned and kept tabs on Aaliyah, typical fatherly behavior, but he was not abusive. His primary focus was on ensuring Aaliyah's success, urging her to go to school, pursue her education, and build a future for herself. Deborah, one of Reuben's sisters, revealed that Regina adopted a different approach to parenting, leaning towards leniency, which also led to conflicts within the family. Money matters exacerbated the strain in their relationship, especially when Regina lost her job earlier that year. According to Reuben's sisters, Regina continued her excessive spending habits despite the financial constraints. This created a significant source of tension, with Regina pretending everything was fine, despite their tight budget. The financial constraint also took a toll on Regina's mental health. She exhibited mood swings, erratic behavior, and temper flares. Her outgoing nature with family and friends started to wane, and she began isolating herself at home. Regina faced challenges getting out of bed, often spending entire days in bed, which strained her relationship with Aaliyah. Aaliyah, in turn, found herself becoming a caretaker for her mother, jeopardizing her own well-being as her mother's struggles took a toll on the family dynamics. Allegations surfaced, suggesting that Reuben was a habitual cheater. This sparked intense arguments and tension within the household. Investigators pondered whether Aaliyah's relationship with Xavier may have also served as a widening wedge between mother and daughter. Witnessing her child navigate the challenges of high school and gain independence, Regina may have been challenged with a distorted perception, feeling the loss of her daughter and husband and questioning what else she had left. Reuben's sisters disclosed that Reuben attempted to seek professional help for Regina. Concerned about her deteriorating behavior, he was adamant about getting her medicated and even considering hospitalization. As the situation worsened, the sisters urged Reuben to leave, recognizing the severity of Regina's condition. Reuben recognized that his marriage was falling apart because of Regina's mental illness, but he didn't feel it was the right time to leave. He still loved her, he still cared about her, and he was worried about her, so he took her to the doctor. His priority was to see his wife better, despite his desire to leave. At Reuben's encouragement, Regina eventually sought help with medication and therapy aimed at improving her well-being. However, Reuben's sisters now believe that these interventions fell short, but Reuben continued his efforts to save his marriage. When detectives received the results of Reuben and Aaliyah's autopsies, it aligned with what Reuben's sisters had asserted. The coroner found no gunshot residue on Reuben's hands, eliminating the possibility of him shooting Aaliyah. Regina alleged that she shot Reuben in retribution after he allegedly shot Aaliyah. She claimed she shot him first in the stomach and then in the head out of fear that he might come back to attack her, alleging she killed Reuben in self-defense. Defense. However, the autopsy results presented a conflicting narrative. They indicated there was no residue on Reuben's hands, establishing that he was likely incapacitated after the first shot, and the subsequent gunshot wound to the head mirrored Aaliyah's execution-style shooting. 
Forensic findings from the crime scene further pointed to Regina as the sole shooter. Despite her assertion that Reuben shot Aaliyah, his fingerprints are absent from the gun, while Regina's prints are found on critical components, the slide, the grip, and the magazine, signifying she loaded the gun. And if she loaded the gun, she premeditated the murders. Detectives subpoenaed Reuben and Aaliyah's phone records, and what they found also cast doubt on Regina's account of the tragic Wednesday morning. Regina claimed the events unfolded before 10 a.m., before Aaliyah was to go to school. However, phone records reveal Reuben's phone was active until 11.30 a.m. Aaliyah's phone activity ceased around 8 a.m. The silence on Aaliyah's phone was an indicator that she was likely dead several hours before her father. Aaliyah was known to be a prolific texter who was always on her phone, but suddenly all activity went silent after 8 a.m. The chain of events. On the morning of May 29, 2012, Reuben left the house at 8 a.m. Around the time when he left, Aaliyah took a shower to get ready for picture day at school. Regina retrieved the gun and loaded it. Aaliyah had just gotten out of the shower Hour, which explains why the petroleum jelly was found by her body. As she was getting ready, Regina walked up behind her and shot her in the back of the head at close range and in cold blood. Prosecutors aren't sure why Regina shot her daughter, but they have no doubt that she did. Aaliyah fell to the floor face down. She never saw it coming. Then Regina laid in wait approximately three hours for Reuben to come home. When Reuben came home from his doctor's appointment around 11 a.m., he made himself some lunch, pizza, and salad. Then on his way to his room, he walked by Aaliyah's room and discovered his daughter's body on the floor. Stunned by what he saw, he dropped the fork, plate of pizza, and salad and ran into Aaliyah's room to investigate, but was surprised to see Regina standing there with a gun in her hand. He had no time to react when she pointed it at him. While trying to reason with her and likely begging for his life, Reuben attempted to retreat from the room, backing out of the doorway when Regina shot him in his side. Reuben fell to the floor. He was incapacitated. According to the coroner, Regina tracked Reuben during the incident. After her first shot at him, she walked through Aaliyah's room, then around the corner, following Reuben as he retreated. Then she stood over him and executed him. Prosecutors believe that Regina had not intended to stop at killing Reuben and Aaliyah. She was losing everything she cared about, her job, her role as a mom, Aaliyah, and Reuben. He had been cheating on her for years, so her plan was, rather than lose everything, she would destroy herself along with her family. But she hesitated. Regina then placed a blanket over Aaliyah's body. She tried to muster the courage to finish the job, but couldn't. She allowed their bodies to decompose for three days while she thought about how to get away with what she had done. So she came up with a plan. She picked up the shell casings, planted the gun next to Ruben's body near his head. She got rid of the depression medications she had been taking and wrote a message in lipstick on the bathroom mirror. The message said, you know I should not have been taking all those pills. This is your your fault. You told Reuben to give it to me anyways. Five pills. Although Regina made statements that she believed Reuben was attempting to poison her with painkillers, she later contradicted this claim by saying in court that the message on the mirror was intended for her doctor, not Reuben. Then Regina laid beside her daughter's lifeless body for three whole nights before calling her sister-in-law in Washington State to tell her that Reuben and Aaliyah were dead. Then on the morning of June 2nd, around 1.30 a.m., police responded to the Johnson's San Carlos condo. The absence of gunshot residue on Reuben, the phone records, Reuben's DNA on the fork, and other forensics at the scene collectively raise skepticism about Regina's version of events. But what detectives feel they may never know is exactly how much time Regina allowed to lapse between firing the first bullet into Reuben and delivering the final fatal shot to his head. They will never know what transpired in those moments or what words were exchanged as he lay there. Detectives strongly believe that Reuben begged for mercy. 
When it became clear that Reuben could not have been the killer, as Regina claimed, the police arrested her for hunting down and killing her daughter and husband. Reuben's family experienced a sense of relief and vindication with the news. From the outset, they never entertained the belief that Reuben could have committed such a heinous crime. Reuben's sister, Deborah, said their experience has been a nightmare that they can't seem to wake up from. She said that the family has so many questions. Why? would she do this to her daughter? She was a child. But those acquainted with the couple struggled to reconcile with the idea that Regina could be a murderer. The belief was widespread, and many clung to the hope that Regina's narrative somehow aligned with the truth. Friends and neighbors who witnessed Regina as a caring mother found it inconceivable that she could be responsible for such a tragedy. Despite the mounting evidence, there was a collective reluctance to accept the reality that Regina, a person they knew, was capable of such a horrific act. As the legal process unfolded, Regina's mental health took center stage. Influenced by the circumstances of her mental illness, the court conducted a preliminary hearing and deemed her mentally incompetent to stand trial due to her depression. Instead of facing a courtroom, Regina found herself in a psychiatric hospital for two years before her competency was determined to have been restored and she was returned to San Diego to face charges. It wasn't until October 2017, a staggering five years after the tragic murders, that Regina finally faced trial. The protracted timeline undoubtedly took a toll on Reuben's family, prolonging their anguish. The two-week trial was a profoundly emotional and divisive experience. Supporters were sharply divided between those advocating for justice for Reuben and Aaliyah and those standing in support of Regina. The courtroom dynamics created a split among individuals who once considered themselves family. The affection Reuben's sisters once held for Regina had vanished, leaving no trace of the connection they once shared. In the courtroom, they witnessed what seemed to be a mere shell of the person who was once an integral part of their family. Surprisingly, Regina's defense strategy did not hinge on an insanity plea or her mental state. Rather, they opted for her to take the stand and recount the events. But there was one problem. When Regina testified, she repeated the story exactly as she told the police during her initial interview. And unfortunately, her narrative didn't align with the forensic evidence. I didn't kill my dog. Would you have any reason to kill your dog? Mr. Bessie. Everybody that knows me knows that Aaliyah, she was the love of my life. Did you kill know Yes. Did you know because he was having affairs? No. <laughs> Ruben had been having affairs since Aaliyah was born, you know, so no. You know, I just, I got immune to it. Like I said, I just, it was like, it was nothing for me because like I said, Ruben and I weren't sleeping together. The jury deliberated for three days before reaching a verdict, convicting Regina of second-degree murder. The absence of premeditation, a critical element for a first-degree murder charge, led to this outcome. The prevailing belief was that Regina did not premeditate the murders, but instead experienced a mental breakdown at the time she committed the crimes. We, the jury, in the above-entitled cause, find the defendant, Regina Renee Johnson, not guilty of the crime of first degree murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A. Regina Johnson then heard the words guilty of second degree murder twice for both her husband and for her daughter. This all happened five years ago in their condominium in San Carlos. She claimed that her husband killed the daughter because he was upset with her. She then shot him. Well, three days passed as she sat with those bodies and it wasn't until after some relatives called police for a, a welfare check that those bodies were found. During her sentencing, Regina Johnson's sister was visibly distraught, shedding tears throughout most of the hearing as Regina read an open letter to her daughter in court. Judge Joan Weber remarked that Regina was the sole individual who truly knew what really happened that day. 
She emphasized, the one thing we know is that the story you told the jury was not what happened. This statement by the judge triggered an emotional outburst from Regina. No longer able to remain composed at her defense table, she launched into a tirade directed at the judge, accusing her of being an unfair judge. Judge, how can you say that? They never proved anything. Johnson. Nobody ever said, they never even had a motive. Why? Why? How can you sit there and say that I killed my daughter? How? You you have no... How can you say the things that you're saying? Because I wrote on the wall, I wrote on the mirror, this is all your fault. I didn't confess to killing anybody. I, I talked about the pill. Ms. Mrs. Johnson. Nicole, Miss Rooney, she's talking about Ruben was begging for his life. Was she there? Is there any record that says I said Ruben was begging for Mrs. his Johnson, life? I, I said, come Mrs. on, John, you have never agreed to anything. Every time Mr. Bessie has ever said anything, you have always denied him the right to say anything. To say anything. How can you even sit there and say the evidence? What evidence? None of the evidence you're saying, no, it's not true. Mrs. Johnson. Judge, you are not a fair judge. You are not. You talk about the evidence. You don't even know what the evidence really was. None of that stuff she talked about was true. She talked about me sweating for Ruben to come home. They talked about Aaliyah not even being in the house that morning. That Aaliyah was somewhere in 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 UTC. Okay. She was fourteen. How did she get to Mr. UTC? Mr. Bessie, they talked about me just standing over over Ruben and shooting him. Ruben was standing up when I shot him. I shot him because he shot my daughter. The pain and devastation from this tragedy rippled through not only Ruben's family, who lost a beloved brother and niece, but also Regina's family as they were witnessing the unraveling of a person they once knew. Good morning, everyone. My name is Regina West. I am Regina Johnson's sister. Regina Johnson's sister-in-law. Can you believe it? Aunt and her godmother. I had written down all the things that I thought I wanted to say this morning to try and prepare myself, but I think at this moment I can speak from my heart. Anyone that knows my sister knows that she would give her last dime to help anybody. Her heart is as big as gold. She was a second mother to me growing up. She was always there for me. She took me to my first day of school. She was there when I fell. If I was having a boy or a girl, she was my man of honor, my wedding. She's been there for every important and crucial time in my life. She always has a kind word to say for me. She's always been a calming effect and knew the right thing to say to get me through any situation. The one thing my sister always wanted to be was a mother. And I remember when Ruben and her told our family that they were having a child. They flew up to Washington. It was Thanksgiving. And it was the, one of the most joyous days in our life because they had tried for so long to have a child. I named Aaliyah. I remember nights when we spent going through a list of names trying to decide what was the perfect way, a perfect name for a perfect little girl. And Aaliyah's middle name is True, which is named after our mother, which is a middle name that is shared by my daughter as well, to honor our mother. Anyone that knows their relationship knows that my sister would do anything to protect her daughter, to cherish her daughter, to honor her daughter. Aaliyah never wanted or needed for anything. My sister would spend her last time to ensure that Aaliyah was happy. Aaliyah was her life. As she spoke, and I'm sure many spoke before, they were more than mother and daughter, they were best friends. It was a rare type of relationship, a special kind of love. And it's something that I'm sure many mothers and daughters wish they had. I could go on and on, Your Honor, about my sister as a person. 
As Mr. Bessie spoke, she never had any money to pull off. She never had a parking ticket. She never, she's never been in a court. She's never been in any type of trouble in her life. As a wife, her and Ruben went through issues in their marriage, just like any married couple does. There's never a, a perfect marriage, but they tried the best to work through it. And I know that they loved each other. I'll end by saying this. One thing I know is that when Aaliyah left this room, she knew how much her mother loved her. And that's something that would never change. It's my sister's love for her daughter. And her daughter's love for her. She was the most important person in my sister's life. And my sister was the most important person in hers. I know Aaliyah loved her with all her heart. And Aaliyah would do anything for her. I can't change the happy drop. But I know, I know that God's looking over my sister. And I know that Aaliyah and my father are looking over my sister from heaven. And I just ask for grace and mercy for my sister. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. On November 17, 2017, Judge Weber handed down the maximum sentence. Regina Renee Johnson, age 60, received a prison term of 80 years to life for the 2012 murders of her beloved teenage daughter, Aaliyah, and her husband, Reuben Johnson. What do you think about this case and its unbelievable chain of events? This situation highlights how important it is to be aware of mental health and provide support. The stigma, especially in communities of color, needs to disappear. Despite Reuben and Aaliyah's efforts to help Regina. The tragic outcome emphasizes how tough it can be to handle mental health issues within families. What else do you think could have been done to help Regina? Do you think the court's decision to convict on second-degree murder instead of first-degree was the right decision? Let's continue the conversation down in the comments section below. As always, I'll meet you there. Thank you, Aaliyah and Ruben, for being examples of love and light. May you rest in eternal peace.